Hi there. You're listening to The Hellenistic Age Podcast, Episode 5, The King is Dead, Long Live the King. The character of Alexander the Great is as intriguing as he is complicated. Alexander is an incredibly polarizing character, heavily contrasted by the various cultures he left his mark upon. Chivalrous and noble, yet hedonistic and a despot, reserved and philosophic, yet prone to anger and passion. It is difficult to definitively pin down the man, largely because we tend to look at his history through the filters of our times. Generals, kings, and men of all nations have attempted to imitate an idealized version of him, from Roman emperors to 19th century German authors, who thought of him as a state builder and bringer of Western culture to a decadent Oriental race. Alexander has been reviled in the Persian and Indian traditions, viewing him as a barbarian who viciously destroyed the prosperous Achaemenid Empire and subjected the peoples to Hellenistic overlordship. The tendency to name him the Great is something that many popular figures and historians tend to scoff at, assuming that the conquest of nations and the slaughtering of tens of thousands could hardly constitute a figure of virtue. Regardless of whatever moral character he may have, it is no doubt impossible to say that Alexander is not one of the most important and influential figures in all of human history. But the historiography from Alexander is almost entirely based upon sources written by authors born long after Alexander's death. The original sources written from the period have all effectively been lost over the march of time. Thankfully, we managed to have a collection of sources who use these original works, five main authors who form the basis of the historiography of Alexander's life and career. The first, and perhaps most thorough of these sources, is the Anabasis of Alexander, written sometime in the 2nd century AD by a Greek-speaking Roman historian named Arian. Arian, in clear emulation of Xenophon's Anabasis, thoroughly covers the military campaigns of Alexander in rather precise detail. The main source that Arian utilized was the memoirs written by one of Alexander's subordinate commanders and childhood friend, Ptolemy, son of Lagos later Ptolemy I Soter, who became king of Egypt in the wars of the Diadochoi. We tend to get a more of a positive spin of Alexander's actions from Ptolemy, and by extension Arian, which seems a bit convenient to begin with given that much of Ptolemy's legitimacy as king is dependent on Alexander's unofficial blessing. Not to mention the rather dubious claim that Ptolemy, as a king, would not lie due to his regal duties, which is the claim that Arian makes of why he relied on Ptolemy so much. As superficial as an argument that would be today, this could probably stem from the fact that Ptolemy likely couldn't lie or stretch the truth too far in any one direction, considering the likelihood that veterans and other officials of Alexander's campaign could still be alive to dispute, including other kings. The other main source used by Arian is the recordings of Nearchus, another childhood friend who is in charge of the navy Alexander ordered to be built at the Hydaspes River in modern Pakistan, documenting their adventures in ancient India. Arian is also regarded as very trustworthy when it comes to the military practices of Alexander, given that Arian himself was a cavalry commander of the Roman army, and would thus understand the nuances of leadership and battle more than sources whom might be considered quote-unquote armchair generals. In Arian's eyes, What defined Alexander the most was pothos, a longing that pushed Alexander to try and constantly achieve great deeds and emulate the heroes like his ancestors Achilles and Heracles. The next author is Diodorus Siculus, writing in the middle of the 1st century BC, who penned his voluminous Library of History. Of the books that survive, the life of Alexander is among them, and it covers a wide range of perspectives of the king. As one scholar put it, the word library implies the vast collections of sources that Diodorus used, often not fact-checking and being a bit naive in his acceptance of the veracity of his sources. Still, it provides an excellent understanding of the background that Arian does not cover, such as the early years of Alexander's life and court intrigue at Pella, plus additional information about Greece during the campaigns. It is theorized that there are two main sources for Diodorus one being a pro-Alexander historian, 
and one being anti-Alexander, though to determine who they exactly are is almost impossible. The third is Plutarch of Chaeronea, the famous biographist who penned a series of parallel lives of Greeks and Romans. Plutarch, in the strictest sense, is not a historian, but is instead a bit of a moralist and a biographer, striving to understand the character of the man he writes about. He himself sums up his work best in his introduction to Alexander's life. Quote, My subject in this book is the life of Alexander, the king. If I do not record all of his most celebrated achievements, or describe any of them exhaustively, but merely summarize, for the most part, what they accomplished, I ask my readers not to regard this as a fault. For I am writing lives, not history. And the truth is that the most brilliant exploits often tell us nothing of the virtues or vices of the men who perform them, while on the other hand, a chance remark, or a joke, may reveal far more of a man's character. End quote. In Plutarch's opinion, Alexander was subject most strongly to thymos, a part of the soul that produces emotions that power action, but, if untampered, can result in unending ambition and destructive behavior. The fourth is the work by Quintus Curtius Rufus, a Roman author during the reign of the Emperor Tiberius. If that alone doesn't suggest the type of picture Rufus will seek to paint, then one merely need to glance at the works of Tacitus. Rufus portrays a more devious and debauched Alexander, much in a level of allegory for his impressions of the intrigue going on at the court of Tiberius. In it, we see less usefulness when it comes to the military movements and geography, but we can see a plethora of speeches and rhetoric. But it does provide a contrast to the more positive impressions of Arian and Plutarch, and to some extent Diodorus. The last main source is the Epitome of Justin from the late 4th century AD, which is a work based upon a series of original works done by the 1st century Roman historian Pompeius Trogus. Trogus originally wrote a universal history, which stretched as far back as the Neo-Assyrian Empire with a legendary queen like Semiramis down to the conflicts of the 1st century BC, which has been lost. But our nearly anonymous compiler Justin managed to summarize the work in an epitome. While the epitome has moments of usefulness when it comes to assessing the life of Alexander, his true value lies in providing details of later Hellenistic history, and we will rely upon him more as the series progresses further down the line. Okay, so enough background information. Let's begin with the life of Alexander in his early years. Alexander III was born on July the 20th, 356 BC, son of the Macedonian king Philip II, and the beautiful and highly ambitious Olympias. Olympias was a daughter of a king of Molossian Epiros, a neighboring Greek state to Macedonia, who had an ancestry reportedly linked back to the hero Achilles. Olympias and Philip apparently fell in love after meeting one another in some sort of religious mystery cult, and for some time she remained the principal wife of Philip. Typical of figures of great renown, both Alexander's birth and conception were filled with portents and omens, and boy, there are a lot of them. One story suggested Olympias's womb was struck by a thunderbolt, and Philip dreamt of sealing it. Apparently, you don't seal something that's empty, so that must mean she was already pregnant at this point. Another story is that Olympias, a priest in some Orphic snake cult, had somehow been impregnated by a divinity who took the form of a serpent. In some respects, this is possibly a later invention by Olympias herself to justify Alexander's heritage as bordering the line between man and divinity given his ancestry to Achilles on Olympias' side and Heracles on Philip's. If Alexander was a son of Zeus Ammon, king of the gods himself, then more the better for propaganda's sake. It also could be Olympias' creation after her and Philip's relationship had long since soured, and Alexander would undoubtedly be sort of a mama's boy, remaining strongly under her influence for his youth, much to Philip's chagrin but even Alex would become tired of her manipulations, remarking at one point that she charged a high rent for nine months of stay. Alexander's appearance was marked by a number of characteristics that many ancient scholars sought to interpret as signs of personality or temperament. Alexander was muscular, if slightly short and stocky, with a fair complexion and a bit of a ruddy tinge on his cheeks, 
blondish brown hair and a slight heterochromia of the eyes, meaning that one was slightly different color than the other. Most notably, he had a particular style to him that many rulers, both in the Hellenistic period and onwards, would try to imitate. He seemed to carry himself with a slightly tilted neck, and his eyes looking longingly towards the distance above, ever the present youth. Virtually almost all of the portraits on coins, statues, and mosaics seem to capture this aspect of Alexander, and some scholars suggest that Alexander's characteristic turn of the head was actually the result of a deformity of the vertebrae of the neck, a la scoliosis. Raised at the court of Pella, Alexander was taught in matters both academic and martial. Typical noble Macedonian military upbringing included hunting and various forms of athletic training, horsemanship, and sparring. Alexander had a number of tutors and pedagogues, but the most famous of all is the philosopher-scientist Aristotle. It seems that Aristotle didn't harbor any hard feelings about Philip sacking his native city of Stagira, and he took to Alexander with apparently great fondness, which was reciprocated in turn. Instructing Alexander in the art of politics, ethics, and philosophy, Aristotle instilled a love of learning in the young king-to-be. The relationship can be most testified to by Aristotle's gift of an annotated version of Homer's Iliad, something that Alexander would carry with him in his march across Asia, surprising considering that it would have been a large scroll, which Alexander kept tucked underneath his pillow along with a dagger, so the discomfort appears to have been worth the price of reading. The Iliad in particular played a strong role in the psychology and motivations of Alexander throughout his life. Stressing Arian's theme of pothos, the ambitions of Alexander were fostered partially by the semi-divine heritage both sides of the family seemed to express. Alexander felt a kinship and parallel to Achilles, the greatest hero in the Greek world, paying his respects at the supposed site of Troy later in his campaigns. In many ways, the martial ethos and desire to perform great deeds in the style of these heroes helped add to the restless nature of Alexander. The question of the blurring line between divinity and humanity is something that will be ever-present throughout his campaigns, and in future episodes, I wish to speak about it more. Of course, like his conception and birth, Alexander's youthhood could not be lacking any hints of greatness. Signs of his intelligence, bravery, and ambition appear in a number of anecdotes. As a boy, he would often complain about his father's victories, based upon the perception that the more places and peoples Philip conquered, the less he himself would also be able to conquer in turn. In a particularly famous incident, Philip was receiving a Thessalian horse seller who was trying to sell a prized stallion named Bucephalus for the rather ridiculous sum of 13 talents, which is an absolutely enormous amount of money. While watching each rider failing to break the steed, Alexander brazenly complained to his father that he alone knew how to calm the beast, and even offered to pay if he had failed. Philip, both fearful, given that falling off horse could easily have killed someone in these days before modern medicine, and partially amused, he beckoned Alexander to try. Alexander deduced that it was the horse's own shadow being cast by the sun which was spooking it, and coaxed it in way in the other direction. He then proceeded to mount and then break Bucephalus to the jubilant cheering of everyone around. Both this scene and Bucephalus will be commonly depicted in art, and Bucephalus will serve as Alexander's noble steed until his death in the Indian campaigns. In addition to his tutors, Alexander was surrounded by a cadre of close friends and companions that were educated in the same manner given their noble status. Ptolemy, son of Lagos, Nearchus, Eumenes of Cardia, and Leonatus, among others, would all be key players in the wars of the successors, and many of them would become kings in their own right. The closest of these friends would be Hyphestion, his lifelong companion, the Patroclus to Alexander's Achilles, and possibly his lover. I need to clarify what I mean when I speak about the sexuality of Alexander, who had a number of relationships that both explicitly and implicitly suggest amorous or sexual bonds. Our notion of homosexuality and heterosexuality differs from that of the period of Alexander. It was not uncommon for men to take other male lovers without the strict social implications that such an act would mean today. It was a relatively common Greek practice, for example in the pederastery of the Spartans and the Theban military bunks. In any case, Hyphestion would remain a close confidant of Alexander, with one proverbial incident stressing the closeness of the pair, 
when Darius III's mother mistook Hyphestion for the Macedonian king, to which Alexander courteously replied, he too is Alexander. Philip, despite the rather toxic influence of Olympias against him, had Alexander remain the principal heir of the throne, and was clearly very proud of the latent talents of his son. Rejoicing at Alexander's breaking of Bucephalus, he reportedly exclaimed, quote, My boy, you must find a kingdom which is your equal. Macedonia is too small for you. Philip fostered Alexander's education with tutors and gave him considerable command of power. During Philip's siege of Byzantium, Alexander was made standing regent at 16 years of age, and was allowed to command a force against a rebelling tribe and establish a colony of Alexandropolis. Never one for modesty, this would be the first of many cities he named after himself. Alexander was also the head of the companion cavalry charge that crushed the line of the Theban sacred band at the Battle of Chaeronea in 338 as well. Still, there was a level of insecurity of Alexander that had led to some rather icy moments that damaged the relationship between he and his father. The breakdown of Philip and Olympias' marriage created intense friction between the two, largely as a result of Olympias' personality and the polygamous practices of the Macedonian kings. Philip at one point had apparently betrothed Alexander's half-brother, Philip Aridaeus, a figure of questionable intelligence, to a princess of Carrier for a military alliance. Alex, disturbed at the implications, intercepted the Carrion leader, and insulted Aridaeus, offering his own hand instead. Philip then furiously scolded Alexander, pointing out that Alexander was not worth the hand of a barbarian princess anyways, and attempted to banish some of Alexander's personal entourage of friends, including Ptolemy and Nearchus. Probably the most tumultuous moment of their relationship was during the wedding party of Philip and his new wife Cleopatra. Alexander sat in the background, stewing already, and was insulted by the drunken toast of Cleopatra's uncle, Attalus, who beckoned everyone to pray for the union of Philip and Cleo to produce a legitimate heir. In response, Alexander threw a cup at Attalus's head, blasting Attalus for suggesting that he was a bastard. In response, Philip, both very angry and very drunk, attempted to pull his sword against Alexander, but instead tripped over himself, with Alexander retorting, Here is the man who is making ready to cross from Europe to Asia, and who can't even cross from one couch to another without losing his own balance. Alexander's friends quickly pulled him away, and he was exiled along with Olympias back to their home of Epiros for a number of years. In time, Philip would reconcile with Alexander and allow him to return home back to Pella. Unfortunately, father-son bonding time would not last for long. In 336, Philip hosted a royal banquet and games to celebrate the union of his daughter Cleopatra with his brother-in-law, Alexander of Epiros. A procession of statues of the twelve Olympian gods and the thirteenth statue of Philip along with them were carried throughout the banquet. It seems that Philip himself was no stranger to self-aggrandizement, like Alexander. Philip had recently declared to his Greek allies in the League of Corinth that he had sought to invade Persia, to right the sacrilege inflicted by Xerxes in the second Persian invasion on the Greek peoples, and his general Parmenion was already making steady progress in the initial forays into Asia Minor. Things seemed to be going quite well for the Argid household. Well, things didn't go so well. A Macedonian named Pausanias, a former lover of Philip, was apparently sexually abused at the hands of Attalus, uncle of Philip's new wife Cleopatra. He appealed to Philip, but was rebuked so that Philip did not offend his new in-law. For many years, he had nursed a grudge against Philip, possibly stowed on by Olympias. Upon the day of the wedding banquet, Philip decided to dispense with bodyguards as a show of good grace towards his guest. Pausanias took his chance and plunged a dagger into Philip's chest, killing the king and is ending his successful reign of 24 years. Pausanias attempted to escape, but was tripped up and slain by Perdiccas and Leonatus, both close friends of Alexander. There is an accusation by Justin that Olympias was the mastermind behind the work, who sought to eliminate any further chance of a rival to the throne for Alexander, and possibly suggests that Alexander himself was aware of this act. 
it is rather suspicious that Pausanias decided to wait until this very day, which would allow Alexander to immediately assume direct control, and with Pausanias dead, any chance of information from confession is impossible. I personally find it unlikely that Alexander was part of a plot to kill Philip, given the lack of testimonies by Plutarch and Arian, but the circumstances around it are certainly suspicious. Still covered in the blood of his father, Alexander was immediately hailed as Basileos of Macedonia and Strategos Autocrator of the League of Corinth. The responsibility for leading the campaign against the Achaemenid Empire would follow into the hands of the young king. With Philip's death, however, political stability became shaky, and it looked like Alexander had some business to take care of in his own kingdom. Thank you all for listening to this episode. Please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes if you can, or you can follow me on a number of platforms, including SoundCloud, Spotify, and Stitcher. If you want to reach me, you can send me an email at hellenisticpodcast, hellenisticagepodcast at gmail.com, or visit my website at hellenisticagepodcast.wordpress.com. Until next time, you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>